so mantra to retention is effective engagement right let's say microsoft for example now let's say microsoft is your customer the stake is really really high you were there at an id for 2 years and quite a prestigious college right mm-hmm. still i wanted to understand what was 2 years really worth it to make the user experience better of a product mm-hmm. you need an entire army working with you rather than uh, you know you yourself fighting the battle alone and uh, i during that phase i learned how not to focus only on the ui but to focus on problem solving because you are building something from scratch again the design community is constantly in a flux whether we should be doing a design course or should we just be self taught designers now both have their were advantages but yeah. i just want to know what your take is on last <laughs> i will not no i will not laugh okay smile. okay yeah Hi everyone, welcome to the first season of Behind the Screens. Today I have with me Geeta Bhatt, who is the VP of Product Experiences at CleverTap, a customer analytics and engagement platform. She's been there for nine years from the very beginning. She was in the founding team. Now CleverTap's grown massively, and I really am looking forward to kind of understand her entire journey in design, uh, how she grew the team, how she kind of got to where she is right now. So, without any further ado. please join me in welcoming her so thanks geeta for joining us i really appreciate you coming here and i'm looking forward to really have a great genuine conversation with you likewise happy to be here yeah, i'm glad and i i think uh, geeta i want to start with this one question that i just talked about right that 9 years at clever app and before that you know you had this incredible journey in design throughout how did you start in design what was the journey like i i might just sound very old when i say this but uh, when i was schooling there was nothing like a design degree or design education right you uh, either chose science commerce or arts uh, and and uh, if you happen to score well in grade 10 you by public demand you just got into science which i uh, did and uh, after 12th grade science i applied and got into jj school of architecture Uh, but very next day i chose to leave it and then i persuaded computer science engineering uh, don't ask me why i did that uh, but i did that uh, and and during the last few years of uh, computer science engineering i happened to stumble upon masters courses at nid uh, and they sounded very interesting and that's how i got into uh, nid luckily uh, and then after i think it is a natural progression of events that led me to uh, the world of design which i am in today i still actually regret not persuading architecture uh, from jj but i think uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of nice that i i finished my computer engineering because the kind of product clever tap is the kind of uh, complexity it has uh mm. i think i can relate and design for a product that complex only because i uh i i come from a background of computer science yeah and i mean i i'm sure because i've seen and we've seen a lot of designers coming from architectural backgrounds these days but i think the relevance that computer science would bring to typically saas or now probably looking ai based products right towards the end it's just uh it's it's a different ball game to understand those pieces but that being said you know you have you were there for and you were there at an id for 2 years and quite a prestigious college right mm-hmm. still i wanted to understand was those 2 years really worth it uh you know because like what was that like yeah and since we are specifically talking about an id right i think uh, i think time i spent there 2 years were totally worth it on multiple fronts a an id has a solid brand name you know mm-hmm. instantly when you say an id there is suddenly a lot of respect from the community and industry uh when when i say an 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 id uh but in terms of design education i was 
just the second batch of my discipline of software and user interface design in NID. Uh, back in that time, UX was still new. Correct. And uh, the curriculum in NID or anywhere else wasn't really matured enough to cater to the industry needs. Mm -hmm. So a lot of courses were design basic courses. So we had yeah. courses like storytelling, we had courses like color theory, we had courses like typography and multi-sensory design and information visualizations. So these design basics, which I did at NID, are so deeply imbibed in my mind, subconscious mind that, you know, when I look back at it now, I can use these basics in the, any field of design Correct. I design for, whether it is digital, whether it is uh, interiors, whether it is painting, it, design ba basics really matter. I think, I, and I think two years at NID did that to me. Yeah, I, I still feel, you know, when you kind of talk about things like storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, in just the last podcast, you know, yeah. uh, Every, uh, Nikolang talked about it, uh, you know, Ankur talked about it, yes. uh, everyone, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's not a discipline, or it's not a, just a skill, but it's just way more than that anyone would typically want to do storytelling, okay. that is one. Uh, then you talked about multi-sensory experiences, then you talked about, you know, color theory. I think these basics, regardless of anywhere you go is, is what I believe was is phenomenal and sometimes not really taught in many different uh, colleges or courses of sorts, you know. True that. But that being said, there is always a constant debate, right, in design mm -hmm. and as designers, because you are not required to necessarily be educated to get, uh, not educated is the wrong word, mm -hmm. uh, but not necessarily, you don't need to have a degree of sorts to get into design. So the design community is constantly in a flux whether we should be doing a design course or should we just be self-taught designers? Now, both have their own advantages, but yeah. I just want to know what your take is. Yeah, and th this, uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this, Rowan, because, uh, you know, when you take formal uh, education in design, it, it kind of gives you a structured path to learning the basics which I spoke about. Uh, but I don't think it's an absolute essential to building uh, a career in design. Probably... Uh, because today there are a lot more opportunities in the market where you can just go for six months and, and do an internship, right? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of, uh, you know, non-design uh, course students coming to me and seeking internships related to product design. Mm -hmm. And I think when you, uh, as a student, uh, spend six odd months with a mature uh, design team, it it leaves you with a lot of learnings than probably a typical design course would. So although it has its own advantages, uh, I wouldn't completely disregard that, but I think it's not an absolute essential if you want to grow as a designer. Your but skills and experience matter. If I put it on you now, let's say, you know, Geeta, imagine that you were just starting out, okay? It's, it's not been 15 years since you were in it. Just starting out, if you had to choose that, hey, I spent two years at NID or any other college that teaches great design probably and choosing whether you want to spend two years in a company as an intern, full-time intern or a full-time product designer, what would you choose? I would still choose NID because like okay. I said, these basics Correct. Uh, that are embodied in me are, are so, uh, so precious that Correct. I can apply it to any field, right? So mm -hmm. a skill of storytelling, probably as an engineer, I wouldn't have gone ahead and explored what is storytelling all about. I wouldn't have probably learned uh, deeply about typography uh, if, if I was just an engineer, right? So, so things like design basics is why I think a design school is an absolute essential, but um, but see, you can you can along with an internship, you can always take a course parallelly and learn the design basics. Correct. So so you can't completely disregard the design basics uh, and only do an internship. You have to balance it both. But but like I said, formal education do or don't it's it's totally up to an individual. Got it. I think your you know your sense of telling. Uh, what I sense is that no matter what you do, just get your basics right in Absolutely. one way or the boss, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. You, yeah. 
you get in a great company probably you get in a great course but just get those right right absolutely so so geeta we spoke about your college days right and exciting times and i wanted to get into clever tap now mm-hmm. how did that happen it's been 9 years since the very inception of the company you've been a part of it and you previously before that you know it's not like you just joined clever tap when you started out you had 6 to 7 years of experience probably more before that mm-hmm. from that matured experience why did you decide to join like a startup was just randomly yeah so i uh, i actually was head hunted into burp uh, which was part of infomedia 18 and then that got merged into network 18 and that was the phase uh, during which i met the co founders uh, of uh, clever tap Uh, and when they were leaving network 18 and when they told me about what they were building i actually jumped at the opportunity of building something so challenging from scratch with the people i enjoyed working with the most and and that's how it happened naturally you know i i just left with them and i i started working on this concept uh and second reason being so far if you if you look at my journey mm-hmm. hfi being a services ux as services company and uh, infomedia and network 18 as uh, ux uh, in in media and entertainment industry right. this was completely different field this was ux for b2b saas and it was very different from what i was doing so far so that that truly really excited me and that's how i uh, took the bet yeah i'm going to come to that b2b question a little later on i'm very excited to know that but you know like i said 9 years long time almost a decade now what makes you still go get up in the morning go into the office with a happy smile on your face manage a team there what makes you like just happy yeah and uh, yeah it, it, it is a really long time but but if i break down those 9 years into multiple phases i think uh, you learn a lot Uh, it's it's not it's generally perceived as a stagnancy right if you mm-hmm. spend more than few years at an organization but uh, if you look at those 9 years the organization and hence the product went through multiple phases uh, inception phase growth phase and now the scale phase and each phase left me with a lot of learnings during inception phase I was new to domain myself so it was all about learning the domain it was all about building a product from scratch which didn't exist so it was all about paper pencil powerpoint wireframes <laughs> uh, so yeah so first initial one year was all about that uh, then we actually bootstrapped the product with a 19 dollar uh, ready to use theme for a designer uh, it was pretty <laughs> challenging thing to do right and uh, i during that phase i learned how not to focus only on the ui but to focus on problem solving because you were building something from scratch again so so that was the inception phase and that lasted for about 2 to 2 and a half uh, years after that came the growth phase and that growth phase brought the need for a lot of customization in the product when you do a lot of customization to the product and hire different people to design the product comes the need of standardization and consistency of the product and there comes the need of design system and scaling of the platform etc etc so th- that that growth phase was all about these for me where uh, i learned how to uh, you know uh, draft a standardized design system how to customize the theme components etc during that phase we acquired a lot of key customers also and each of these customers had very very unique use cases and each of these use cases were like a product in itself so creating a unified experience for all of these use cases was was a key during that phase i i, I learned a lot about domain and i think third third point about this phase was also we were building on a legacy system right mm-hmm. uh, javascript using uh, uh, using the basic bootstrap theme mm-hmm. and we decided to shift the front end architecture to vue js so that whole transition was lo- doing like doing a bypass surgery or open heart surgery and and that left me with a lot of learnings about uh, uh, you know how do you transition the front end architecture not just the design and now the scale phase 
in last three years where uh, we are growing a lot as an organization. We have acquired a lot more customers. Uh, there are different problems to solve. We acquired Lean Plum last year, and uh, uh, now the problem of uh, hiring the right team, uh, growing it beyond design to user research, uh, to UX microcopy, uh, training the uh, team, mentoring them, and, and uh, also merging two massive products together, which is not an easy job. We're, we're, we're doing it one at a time, but this is a new problem that I'm solving. Yeah. So if you see last nine, 10 years for me have been full of learnings into different phase, phases of the company. And, and it was never a dull moment, to be honest. And cherry on top of the cake was I was doing this alongside the people I enjoyed working with the most. So yeah, yeah that, that's what kept me going. Oh, I think that's, that's amazing, you know. I, I really enjoy when, you know, I just the thought of it. And, you know, imagine you're in a small, small apartment and you were fairly responsible, if not as the co-founders are very fairly responsible in growing that company from that small room to a bigger yeah. space, to a bigger space, to a bigger space. And you're like, till the time you realize it's nine years, it's just very big, right? Yeah. And I think that's lovely, but... A couple of questions come out of this, right, Geeta, is that two exciting things that you talk about. And the first question is, you talked about, you know, how it's how it's zero to one, mm -hmm. then it's in the growth phase, and then it's in a maturity phase of sorts. Is it fun in the maturity phase, or is it the growth phase that is more exciting? Each phase has its own uh, challenges, I would say. Uh, fun is in both. Uh, see, growth phase has its own challenges because you are still building the product, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the scale phase, you are taking it to the next level. So a lot of innovation may not happen in the scale phase and you might be dealing with different things like people issues, hiring issues, uh, mergers and standardization, which mm -hmm. may not be actual real problem solving related to a use case. Mm -hmm. But during growth phase, uh, like I said, we acquired yeah. a lot of customers and each of Clevertap is not a verticalized product, mm -hmm. right? So we got customers from different mm -hmm. domains. So, you know, Telco had different use cases to ride hailing, to OTT, to e-commerce. So when you mm -hmm. solve for these use cases, uh, it's, it's a lot of challenge. Yeah, lot. And, and sometimes, you know, these use cases become... Uh, so challenging that, you know, funnily, I, I used to tell that, you know, uh, solving for this is like solving an algebraic equation <laughs> without any constants and all variables. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, something else that came in your conversation, and I'm very interested to know that, so I'm going to dive deep. You know, you talked about JavaScript, you talked mm -hmm. about Vue.js, mm -hmm. you talked about front-end architecture. Yeah. But listen, hey, you are a designer, okay? <laughs> how do you know all of this and why do you think, wow, how did that come into the picture of while you were learning design? Yeah, and that's what I, I connected back to what uh, we discussed in the early, uh, early stage of the yeah. conversation we had that, you know, universe had its plan and that's how I, you know, I got kicked from the architecture <laughs> and I got into computer science. I still regret not persuading architecture, but, but that's because I'm still passionate about it. However, my basic knowledge of computer science helps me a great deal understanding the core technology behind the complex product like Clevertap. Now, when you design for a B2B SaaS product, which is heavily data science, you need to understand the technology behind it. It's an absolute non-negotiable. And, and probably because of my computer science background is why I'm, I'm very comfortable navigating around the technology, talking to developers, whether they're front-end, back-end. I can argue about the front end as well as back end logic and that that comes really handy. Yeah. And do you believe every designer should do this? Like not take a full two year computer science course, but you know, try <laughs> four learning, <years>. try <laughs> four years, sorry. <laughs> but try learning tech as much as possible. It has its own advantages to be honest, because uh, I wouldn't say again that uh, it is a blocker to becoming a designer, but if you really want to become a successful designer, which your product and development will take seriously, then I, the answer is yes, yeah. you know, because if as a designer, you know 
what's happening in the engine behind, engine that runs uh, your product, I think there is a different level of, uh, you know, maturity you can bring to the table. Yeah. And I, I, I very really, I relate to you like quite a bit because when I look at it, everyone who's been successful as a designer, I know that those guys understand technology to a mm-hmm. certain extent, not being techies, mm-hmm. but they understand technology to the, to a certain extent. Yeah. So Neeta, that being said, I have a question that's pertinent for many organizations here, right? Mm-hmm. Can you say with confidence that design has helped CleverTap earn more revenue? And if yes, how confident? <laughs> um, great question. <laughs> Actually, interesting question. Uh, but to be absolutely honest, attributing uh, revenue or even adoption directly to design is a super difficult thing to Correct. do. Right? I'm still figuring it out. Uh, why I say that is because when you're designing for B2B organization or, 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 or people who or customers are not really looking at only design or UX when they sign up for a uh, product. product like Clevertap. They're looking for far more than just the design and UX. They're looking for scalability. They're looking for security. They're looking for data pipes going back and forth from their product. They're looking for customer support. They're looking for a lot more beyond uh, you know what we just discussed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I haven't really come across a scenario where design has been a blocker. However, uh, have seen, I've come across scenarios where we have seen an incremental and positive changes in our NPS scores when we have shipped something uh, to do with our design. We have changed the workflows. We have, uh, you know, uh, converted the old flows into new flows. And we've, we've heard positive reviews generally in the qualitative manner uh, from those surveys, etc. But like I said, direct attribution to the revenue hasn't really been seen. So it's very clear that good design has its own contribution to closing deals and retaining customers uh, for a long time once they start using your product. But direct attribution is a very difficult thing to do. But my counter to that weirdly is that, you know, if the customer, the experience sucked, Mm -hmm. how many people would have left? You know, Uh, I'm sure that that will be a good chunk of a number, right? (laughs) (laughs) okay we won't get into that Uh, but you know Gita Clever App is a B2B focused company and in your past you've designed for when you went into things like telco news and media everything is B2C Mm -hmm. how is it that how is that experience really like like when you design for B2B products Mm -hmm. how is that experience different yeah, so B2B is generally perceived as corporate and, you know, boring. boring. And uh, <laughs> B2C is perceived as glamorous and yeah. uh, shiny and playful and fun. Uh, but in my opinion, there is uh, uh, there are similarities between two, especially when you are designing for a B2B product that is meant for other businesses. Yeah. Because there is a user at a receiving end who needs to be onboarded who needs to be given first-run experiences, who needs to be given demo. And these are the parallels, I think, uh, to B2C systems uh, where, uh, where, where the users are uh, drawing parallels between the B2C products they're using and mm-hmm. B2B products they're using. Because, because typically it is the same user, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. it's you and I yeah. uh, at the receiving end probably yeah. uh, in our jobs to be done. I use a Google Pay, and but I'm, you know, somewhere expecting my, you know, B2B products also to have some similar experiences. Maybe not Google Pay, but any other generic apps that yeah. both of us use. Just the difference probably is, you know, as a designer, when you yeah. when you uh, design for a B2B kind of a software, then you have to learn two businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the only difference I feel. The, one is the business which you are designing. And the other is the de- business you're designing for. And I think that learning uh, is is crucial for, you know, designing optimal experiences. Yeah. And I get it. You know, I I actually, I don't recall, recall from where I heard this, but I, I heard that, you know, when you design B2B products, mm-hmm. the stakes are typically high. Now, let's, let me just like, what I'm trying to say is, 
let's say Microsoft, for example, now let's mm-hmm. say Microsoft is your customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the stake is really, really high. Because if they go away, they're not just taking, they're re- taking a big chunk of revenue yeah. together. Yeah. It's not a couple of thousand people who are just taking it. It's a huge, huge, huge deal, right? So Absolutely. I believe in B2B experiences, there's a lot at stake for sure. Absolutely. Uh, not that B2C is lesser, but you know, sometimes that mindset is very crucial that if you do this one thing, we just deliver that right instead of the like, room for experimentation probably gets lower. But anyway, so Gita as designers, right? We are typically, every time what we are doing is we are solving for some goal or the other, be it reducing retention, increasing, uh, sorry, increasing retention, increasing engagement, um, you know, trying to reduce churn, incru- improving conversions, etc. Right? But Clevertap is a product that helps you do that. Yeah. And, you know, you, tomorrow you are actually designing a product that helps you build that retention. So your knowledge and engagement retention, how to do that psychology must be probably phenomenal. But how does that feel? What's that experience really like? Yeah, so so mantra to retention is effective engagement, right? Uh, if, <laughs> if you engage with your end users effectively, Correct. the retention happens. And that engagement needs to happen on multiple fronts. It, mm-hmm. it needs to happen through support. It needs to happen through sales. It needs to happen through product. And when you specifically talk about product, uh, I think as a product and organization, we do a couple of things. A is we constantly innovate with our customers. That means we take the customer's use cases into uh, into consideration and and they, they form the key part of our uh, roadmap. Uh, and B, we test and we, we showcase to our customers what we are building. So uh, after drafting the solutions and designs, we go back to our customers and conduct the user research and uh, usability testing with them to understand if, if the solutions that are crafted are working for them or not. Mm-hmm. So I think that helps generally uh, to users uh, when, when they know that this is something that is coming and this is going to meet my need and this is going to solve my use case. And, and, and then, of course, uh, you know, the, the retention is uh, after effect of uh, all that yeah. conversation that goes on. There is no, of course, when, when it's, it's a little different for B2C, which uh, where you send out push notifications and, you know, you send out emails, etc. Right. Of course, that is a part of uh, the package as well, but your customer is or your user is on your product using it all the time. So uh, unless they are going to find it useful, unless they are going to meet their use cases in your product, the retention is not happening. So I think these are the two ways which uh, which we use in the product and roadmap building. But through which would you say that, Gita, sorry, uh, but would you say that you know, because let's say if I'm using a ride hailing platform or a food delivery platform or any other application per se that I just generally use in my day to day, my engagement becomes somewhere important a little bit, you know, probably. I, but I use that app for a particular span of time. I convert in that app and that is counted as success for me. Mm-hmm. But clever app is a platform that is side window. Absolutely. But it doesn't necessarily mean you know, that your platform is engaging, even though engagement is somewhere getting counted, session times are getting counted, right? Mm-hmm. So what is the metric of success for you on a constant basis? Is it more engagement and usage or the right way to use it or what otherwise? Uh, both actually. See, more engagement, not every... Clevertap is a broad product, right? Yeah. It, it provides you analytics, it provides you engagement, it provides you A-B testing, etc. And not... Every customer is going to use all of these uh, features yeah. also. Uh, so when they come to Clevertap, let's say for creating a campaign, it is a job to be done for them. Uh, so so no matter what, they are going to use Clevertap as a part of their job for a certain time mm-hmm. uh, of the day. And probably as, as uh, a designer, my job is to provide them with the most optimal experience uh, for that feature which yeah. they use uh, so that the experience is enriching and so that their use cases are met without any hassles and they go home, uh, you know, at a destined time. I don't create complications in their, uh, uh, in their work life. Got you. Got you. Because what I was trying to somewhere point out, right, in, is that 
like you rightly said sometimes it's not just engagement yeah. sometimes it's not just conversions yeah. that you need to measure there are many different metrics for example how could geeta and team probably reduce the number of times the customer reached out to us on email or complained about us that could be one of the profound yeah. metrics that you were probably trying to impact uh, that was just my probably end goal to kind of put this across mm -hmm. that being said you know you briefly touched upon research and mm -hmm. you brief like you know, we've been talking about product design in that entire time have you seen anything in your research since our product design says that made you like wow i have not heard of this or wow this is something new uh, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, wow i didn't expect this so <laughs> uh, good and bad uh, but i think one specific thing uh, about human psych which i would like to cite here uh, so back in the time when i was uh, with hfi i learned about this interesting design methodology called pet persuasion okay. emotion and trust based design uh, this methodology was deeply uh, related to human psychology as opposed to designing with heuristics you know and usability uh, principles uh, the research techniques were also different and one of one of the you know key to the user research in the pet technique was the different setup so the moderator and the users sat in the way we are sitting right now mm -hmm. uh they were not sitting across the table okay. uh facing eye to eye uh, facing each other or uh, looking eye to eye down the line uh after a few years uh, i had an interesting situation where an engineering leader came to me and said geeta i have a situation i think i have a very bright candidate uh in there but she is somehow nervous and she is not Uh, she's not doing well she doesn't seem to be doing well in the interview so can you can you just check what's happening can you just uh, you know conduct the interview for 15 minutes i i'll just be out of that mm -hmm. uh, conversation uh, and this was the tech interview of course mm -hmm. i didn't go blank so i had a basic framework in my mind but what i did was the moment i entered in that room i just shifted my chair and i took it right next to the candidate so we were we were sitting the way we are sitting right now oh okay uh and without looking directly into the eye it it was a very natural conversation between the interview candidate and and me uh and after that i was just asked geeta what magic did you do <laughs> and i said why and uh, the candidate just cracked the interview she was very nervous at first but but that whole conversation sitting on the same side of table eased her out so much uh, that it left me with a big big learning thereafter any user research i did face to face i did not sit across the user because it it kind of comes across as you know you are interviewing okay. user and you are questioning the user while when you when you sit with the user or interviewee it's more of a conversation yeah, it's yeah it's it's more of a conversation yeah like right now it doesn't really feel like hey i'm asking you a certain question and you're answering that it's like this is a genuine flow of thoughts yeah. somewhere right i get it i think uh, So Geeta we spoke a little bit about you know your past experiences and act in life at Clever Tab right I want to understand a little bit of your uh you know thoughts from a leadership lens mm -hmm. so when you're kind of young and when you're just starting out you're typically taking and let's say you're given the uh task of building or designing a product or designing a particular feature you typically take inspiration from other competition or other products or you know you ask your mentors etc now after 15 16 years the you know who's my mentor where is he you know in which company is he right it becomes a little challenging my point is that and it diminishes down to originality because sometimes you are at, at such a responsible position where innovation comes first and you know it's not about hey this is what the others are doing this is what we should do or this is what other products look like it's more about everyone's doing this we should do even better or what's next for us because that inspiration requires a different sense so what's your what's your take on that especially kind of how do you draw inspiration day to day inspiration especially when innovating or building something new yeah and and you're absolutely right when you say that uh, you know after a certain point of time you stop taking inspiration 
uh, from other products uh, typically or interfaces go to dribble and you know uh, etc etc uh, and i i might sound a bit spiritual when i say that mm-hmm. but uh, human brains are very complex and we absorb a lot of things right all around us we absorb from universe we absorb from uh situations we absorb uh from humans around us we absorb from conversations we absorb from books media and what not it's it's a whole world around us and and that world constantly teaches us something and and we build our experiences through that uh and as we grow probably as and evolve as a human being these experiences in everyday life bring in that level of maturity in your thinking so uh so after a certain point of time what happens at least it happens with me is when i'm given a problem statement you know the first principles thinking kicks in okay if with my basic design instinct or creative instinct how will i solve this problem and that over powers you know inspiration probably you will still take inspiration you know visually from a uh, few sources you will still create mood boards but i think that experience of uh, you know absorption uh, from from different places is is what brings in the most value yeah because i believe you know at that time you probably have to you know dictate you and you know right in the with the body you know he's saying this the customer mm-hmm. says this but he actually wants this i know it yeah. Yeah. you know and that is like a huge inspiration source or point of differentiation that experience brings yeah, and sometimes you know we call it differentiators where you can't find inspiration from other products you're mm-hmm. building something totally new and you have a- absolute no choice but to sit and think okay map the users natural work process into your product so there is no option for that and you mm-hmm. have to do it with the first principles thinking yeah so i i understand you know how you kind of think differently when it comes to kind of uh, you know more maturely i would say but that being said i want to understand from a leader's lens right that when there are you know sometimes product teams come with different requirements design team wants to do something differently for the user uh, sales team wants to do things for a business yaar ye sab karna hai unko how do you kind of manage all these arguments and how do you somewhere try proving your point mm-hmm. because this is what i've seen that many people struggle with you know trying yeah. to prove ki hum mera point kaise likha hu main aage to that to that when to be honest disagreements are part of life i mean they they are uh they are uh, bound to happen but but when you take them in a constructive and respectful manner i think uh, they can leave you with uh, amazing design solutions amazing uh, solutions overall not just design but um, amazing solutions and problem solving overall and also uh, you know it can help you build amazing relationships i have had several episodes in my uh, journey where i have argued a lot with people and they are still best friends but you have to do it in a very respectful and constructive manner and then i think when when you when i say that what i mean is uh, as a team as uh, when you work with different people you have to build that kind of a safe environment for people to mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, come and genuinely just yeah people to come and uh, showcase their opinions or discuss their ideas you you have to make sure that you don't cut them you don't uh, judge them and uh, you know let them talk you have to be a good listener for that mm-hmm. and when disagreements like this happen and if it is a planned conversation let's say for example it always helps if you have a neutral party moderating that conversation mm-hmm. so that you know you always remember the bigger goal why you are discussing this what is what is it that led us to this disagreement so if you keep that in mind and have some neutral party you know kind of navigating the conversation i think i have i've have found it extremely useful uh, and also i think one of the most important point is uh, whenever you have had this agreements and you are discussing and coming out of that disagreement as a team mm-hmm. it is important to document what came out of it mm mm-hmm. uh, so that you can refer to it and you so that you can own it as a team holistically and move on so geeta when we you know um connected and collaborated during the adp list event right 
there was something that you talked about that, hey, you know, designers should not just look at their existing problem statement, mm -hmm. but look at something called as the extended workflow. Correct. What does that mean? So all designs, but especially when it comes to B2B, these are complex systems and I, I always imagine them somehow like, a, uh, you know, complex assembly of interconnected uh, cog wheels. Yeah. Basically everything moves when one part moves, you know. And that's when I say when, when you change one thing, basically, uh, even if it is the smallest thing, it can cause a ripple effect onto multiple parts of the product. Uh, mm -hmm. When I say you have to think about the extended workflow, you have to understand the problem statement at your hand, understand the magnitude of it, understand why that exists and how it is connected to probably different parts of your product, how uh, changing that or redesigning that will change different parts of or different behaviors of uh, the current behaviors of users. Uh, what is the technology uh, that is going to get impacted if, if it is going to call for, uh, you know, any backend logic change or if, if it is only going to be limited to front end, all of that, you know. So unless you understand the impact you're going to create with the design solution which you're crafting, it becomes a very superficial uh, solution. And that's when I say that, uh, you know, you, you need to understand the ecosystem uh, before, before actually crafting the interface for a design problem. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, coders writing one piece of code, either fadgya, either <laughs> fadgya. But I, I, I relate to that. So one of the other conversations that, you know, we had during that time is that, you know, you mentioned that designers should typically not fall in love with their work. Mm -hmm. While I believe that's true, why do you think so? Yeah, that's because design is an iterative process, right? If you fall in love with the first version you create, you're, you've not really explored what could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no one solution to the problem. You, you really have to go talk to multiple stakeholders, go talk to users, uh, you know, take into consideration different views uh, beyond design again. This is not just, I'm, I'm not just talking about design, I'm just, I'm talking about the solution approaches also. If you don't take all of that into consideration and just stick with one or two options, then you've not explored enough. And possibly that uh, the, the design which you will craft is not going to meet, uh, <laughs> uh, or it's not going to end up being the best one. And which is why not falling in love with that first or second design you've created is very important. You should be able to let it go so that it becomes better eventually. So for, from, uh, from a very first shitty draft to the pixel perfect design, you should be able to discard more uh, than, uh, than create. Uh, one or two options. No, that's a that's a very nice way to put it, right? That you know, a simple thought that you discard more Absolutely. and you put the right things across. Uh, so that being said, Geeta, right? When designers, you know, especially going to this part where discarding more, right? When designers are ideating, they have so many ideas, they have so many concepts, and so many things that you that they have in mind. Mm -hmm. How does someone pick the right idea, mm -hmm. and how does <clears throat> How does someone translate that right idea, the right research that you've done into actual design? Mm -hmm. Number one, I think the key, uh, key problem is whether you've done that research right. Mm -hmm. uh, because research can lead to a lot of data which doesn't make sense. It's yeah. just information overload. So I think before ideation also, if you want to create an effective solution out of that research, I think the key to it is you know, clearly stating why are you doing research, clearly stating the business objective behind it, clearly stating, you know, the problem statements you know about uh, that. And mm -hmm. then that should lead you into uh, possible, you know, outcomes which you can take into design or solution directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and thereafter, I think it is a natural process where you can just churn the data, find patterns and, you know, uh, whatever wins, right? The the pattern that is winning the most, you you convert that into design. But key to this is, of course, going back to users because a lot of times we have a hypothesis around, okay, this is what is going to work because research said so and so. But when you actually draft a design solution 
been with it and you show it to end users and like okay this is what i said but you know <laughs> this is this is still not working for me so we we definitely come across these scenarios where research said something uh and and when we drafted a design using that research it it didn't really meet the user requirement so it has to be a combination of uh research and user testing i would call it data gathering and user testing and of course the design iterative design phase in between where you keep uh you know evaluating your design and and critiquing in, uh, your design and taking it back to the user to to formulate an ideal solution so you know often times you know what i've seen is that when a client or any other stakeholder does not have or has very limited knowledge of design mm-hmm. it becomes very difficult for us designers to communicate the value of design to them right so i wanted to understand how do you do that in <laughs> not probably in a client situation but probably an internal stakeholder that you want to convince agreed agreed but i i i face this situation less often than i used to before <laughs> to be honest uh, so everyone these days understands the value of ux and design but the problem comes when they have to action it <laughs> uh, so my secret to this is uh, to have best friends from different teams from customer success from uh, tech from uh, product people basically who mm-hmm. will give you data about why this problem needs to be solved in the first place that will come from you know customer support request that will come from uh, the adoption data etc so make best friends with them uh, <laughs> uh you know if you have a design in your mind to cater to that problem draft it go to engineers and uh, ask them you know how much time do you think or how many changes do we need to do to back end or front end if if at all we have to do it mm-hmm. get that data about you know how much of a technical effort it is and eventually get somebody from product who's your friend to communicate that hey i need to add this to the product road map and if at all we add this to product uh, road map we are going to solve this this and this so uh, in my opinion we are uh, when when as a designer you want to solve for something we are a part of process right as mm-hmm. as a design we are not entire process so uh, to make the user experience better of a product mm-hmm. you need an entire army working with you <laughs> rather than uh, you know you yourself fighting the battle alone i like the way you call them the army okay and uh, another thing that i realized is people typically know that they have to reach the product people they have to reach the customer support but they often miss out hey listen this tech team right that you know it it's actually going to take 6 months to build this yeah. okay the conversations are over at that time right yeah and the so conversations this. are generally over because the moment a developer says hey you know this is going to take 4 months okay the the so idea is no, 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 no matter how good it is yeah no matter how good it is yeah i and i and i get it then it is just to phase 4 phase 5 right <laughs> <laughs> but that being said right uh, geeta you work with so many people you hired so many in the past mm-hmm. and this question is actually for younger designers mm-hmm. in your experience what are these common mistakes or pitfalls that designers typically make in their early stages of life in the early stages of a career yeah correct um yeah three things i think i would say one is not understanding why behind what you are working on so let's say Uh, and i'm often face this scenario with uh, new designers who come on the team where you know uh, you give them a problem statement and they'll directly start working on the <laughs> interface but but you really need to understand why are you solving that what is the deeper problem behind it right and this is often clogged with very poor understanding of the product you're working on again in a b2c scenario it it may be a little less complex but Uh, working on a complex product like clever tap this is even more difficult because a, if a designer doesn't understand you know that feature in and out with the technical details with the api details etc etc to to just design that stand alone becomes very difficult uh second is not generating enough number of design options we talked about mm-hmm. discarding more than uh, yeah. you know uh, you know keeping and if and i often see designers generating one or two options and then detailing them out at the pixel perfect level 
but the initial phase is all about exploration so more you explore more you will come to know that you know these are different possible ways where i can craft my solution and i think that will help you generally and i think third one is uh, working in complete silos we have become really you know aloof in uh, <laughs> during last 2 3 years and we scaled uh, a lot as a design team at clevertap uh, in in those 2 uh, to 3 years and i i've seen designers working in silos and just uh, limiting their conversations to their own mind or maximum a designer who, who they are comfortable with but discussing it with a broader team conducting design critiques getting stakeholders getting pms getting developers uh, into these discussions definitely uh, help uh, you know making the designs most yeah. optimal and effective so i think these three uh, mistakes which young designers do often uh, can be corrected I, i agree to each of them and i really relate to the first one right the why the reason why i say that is because you know when we are interviewing new candidates mm-hmm. uh, typically at an associate role for example uh, we send them an assignment now let's say whatever that assignment would be it would have a problem statement mm-hmm. now you know sometimes people have certain questions they call us ask us that these are some questions i'm not sure about this what do i tackle but really the ones that stand out you know when they ask the question hey can you tell me why are we even solving this problem uh-huh. because i've not because you've given the assignment it doesn't mean that you know there is no reason to solving the problem correct right so i i genuinely you know related to that mm-hmm. um so yeah geeta along with this we kind of covered many different perspectives um i want to get to a little light hearted session now right okay mm-hmm. uh, i want to ask a couple of quick questions let's call it the rapid fire but i don't like the name rapid fire okay so okay. quick questions uh one word one line answers on all of these right mm-hmm. so What is the one thing that you still feel you haven't learned e- even after with 10 years of experience of sorry 15 years of experience attributing an option and and revenue to design oh yeah that you kind of pointed out during our conversation as well okay in your view what's the one point of differentiation between a good designer and a great designer i think i said it also ability to discard and not fall in love with your first draft Okay. All right. What is your biggest failure in your entire design journey and what did you learn from it? Mm. Conducting designer not design only designer only projects where I have not taken developers and product managers into confidence. When you do that, you become one team and you kind of get your uh you know ux initiative into the mainstream road map and that becomes successful you are able to you know uh nicely break it and shift it to production that's a unique answer <laughs> by the way uh if you had one chance to do something very different in your life anything at all mm-hmm. okay it doesn't necessarily have to be around work what would you do i be more attentive into certain classes Okay. uh during my school and college days because like i said before design not design but any kind of basics matter and i still regret not paying attention to those <laughs> classes in the past <laughs> you know that's actually nobody's ever said that ki yaar maine ek bar class mein no attention nahi diya apne ko aaj dard ho raha hai actually i'm not a doctor yeah yeah thanks to me you're not a doctor mai nahi aata hai mere wo class nahi attend ki thi all right uh what have you read or listened to recently that has inspired you and you cannot say the hard thing about the hard things okay no 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 i have just started reading it and this may sound a little domestic but uh, very inspirational tidying up with uh, mary kondo Uh, okay. it it may sound like it is related is to an organization so this is about tidying up the spaces physical okay. spaces right so they have different episodes where they go to different houses different uh, warehouses where there is a lot of mess and uh, mary kondo uh, as an organization expert she helps people clear out that mess organize the spaces and hence their lives it is very interesting trust wow. me now this is not necessarily only applicable to spaces if you apply the same thing imagine to a messy product correct 
to a messy folder system. situation, to a messy folder system. Perfect. Uh, just the framework she has to tidy up anything is very, very inspirational. And I think I have used that uh, myself uh, in in a lot of things. I think I'm 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 going to say this off camera, but I'm still saying it on camera. Is that I might <laughs> <laughs> that right? This is behind me to tidy up a few things. Yeah. So, what is the one myth in the design industry that you'd like to debunk here today? Don't solve for everything. Not every design problem or not every problem that comes to you is worth solving. Uh, the key to it is uh, uh, you need to address the user need. Now that need could be solved using simple UX copy. It could be solved through a simple fix in the front end or back end logic. It could be simple phone call to user. So everything may not end up becoming a big design workflow in your product. So. Yeah. The moment a problem statement comes to you, try and not solve it immediately. Yeah. Try and question it why. Yeah. As as someone says, not everything needs a redesign. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So looking back on your journey of design, what do you think is the most rewarding or the most fulfilling moment in that journey? How oh, I am. I'm experiencing it right now, actually. Oh, wow. We're uh, we're completing 10 years of Clever Tap oh, wow. and, uh, you know, starting from zero oh, to yeah, yeah. Uh, what it is today, you know, starting from paper and pencil uh, to one of the best products in the B2B SaaS industry of analytics and engagement. It is uh, an absolute rewarding and fulfilling journey for me. And I think uh, that's the biggest one. No, that's lovely. I think I wish I kind of get to experience that <laughs> user journey with pineapple someday, right? So lastly, if you were to collaborate with any designer, living mm -hmm. or deceased, mm -hmm. on a dream project, who would it be and why? Uh, that would be Dumbledore of NID. Oh. <laughs> so Professor M.P. Ranjan, uh, he's no more, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. uh, Professor M.P. Ranjan, had the most progressive vision about information visualization back in the time when, you know, data science and data visualization was still new and nascent. So he, he gave us, and that's when I say, you know, I want to go back to certain classes yeah. and pay more attention. Okay. So uh, now that I have spent so much time into the world of big data and information, I would really love to take back some of the real life problems and go back to his class and solve it with him. Well, that's that's beautiful. I'm very happy that you remember like, you know, such intense moments <laughs> from your NID times. But so Geeta, the last question for today, okay? And mm -hmm. then you can relax. Uh, <laughs> okay, this needs to come from the heart. Mm -hmm. All right. What does product design mean to you? So in one sentence, it is building something that makes people's lives better. Uh, eventually what you build needs to uh, add value to your end user's life. Well, that's a great answer. And with this, we end today's session. Thank you so much, Geeta, for being here and doing this and contributing probably something of this if someone takes and, you know, utilizes this in their life. It's, it's going to be very meaningful to everyone, right? So thank you so much for being here and joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was absolute fun to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much, Geeta.